Good morning. I'm uh, Jay Tang from University of Alabama, Birmingham. I'm chair of the new department of biomedical engineering at the School of Medicine and School of Engineering. Hi, I'm Thomas Eschenhagen. I'm pharmacologist at the University of Hamburg. I'm Maria Contaritis. I'm a faculty at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Harvard Medical School and co-chair for the BCBS conference. Hello, I'm Raj Kishore, a professor at Temple University and I'm also the co-chair for this meeting. So today we are going to talk about the cardiovascular tissue, tissue engineering, the past, the present, and the future. What the, is the uh, cardiovascular tissue engineering will uh, bring us for the um, basic science and uh, uh, translational and clinical re research and therapy. So uh, I'll start the, uh, asking question, uh, Tom, you have been a pioneer in the field of cardiovascular tissue engineering for more than two decades by now, a little bit over. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the, from the perspective of uh, past, the present, and the, and the future of the application from the basic science research perspective as well as the therapy perspective. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, I mean, the initial idea of uh, uh, making three-dimensional heart muscles was a simple one. We just wanted to uh, create a little bit a more physiological model for cardiac research and of course we did that with primary cells and the, so that the past is cardiac uh, heart, or heart muscles from primary cells. The present is, and that's a very important uh, progress in the field, due to the availability of pluripotent stem cells and cardiac myocytes cells from these cells, we are now in, in the very nice comf uh, comfortable situation to be able to make unlimited uh, numbers of these muscles with two major applications. The one is, the old one actually, uh, an improved model for cardiac testing in vitro, both for drug industry but also for, for basic science. And the second one is to use these tissues as a cardiac repair material. And the unique thing is that uh, due to this uh, stem cell technology by Yamanaka and others, um, that we have now human muscles in our hand. I'll ask you the second question. So we know that the, the pluripotent stem cells currently are in a more immature form. Tell us a little bit about how your tissue engineering modeling will allow us to differentiate those cells more like adult cardiomyocytes. Right. I think that this answer is, is, is difficult because it's, uh, it's, it's a, a major question, it's a big question in the field. Nobody has a perfect answer. Our answer at this point is just by putting these cells in a three-dimensional context, allow them to make a three-dimensional tissue and connect to each other and put them under mechanical strain, make them already better. So they are more mature than if you just have them on 2D, but we know as well that that's not sufficient. And there are certain ways, ideas, and also data uh, how to make them better. For example, by chronic pacing. Mm -hmm. We and others have shown that chronic pacing of these tissues make them a little bit better. But until now, we are still not there that we have adult cardiac myocytes with t tubules and all these things you, you would like to have. Mm -hmm. So I think it, we are on a good way, but we are not yet there. And the answer is likely some combination of growth factors, differentiation molecules, which are not so clear yet. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about co-culturing these with multiple yes. cell lines, yeah, cell that, types? That, yeah, that's a, an obvious and very good question. Initially, of course, when, you ma when we made these tissues from native heart cells, we had all in. Endothelial cells, fibroblasts, smooth muscles, even macrophages, which are maybe important. With the pluripotent stem cells, we do not have these, tissues in, uh, these cells in, so we are systematically mixing them in. And we and others, again, show that that improves the tissue a little bit. So it's probably a combination of factors. Right. But paracrine effects are certainly very important. All right, Tom, let me pitch in. So uh, the goal probably is to have uh, uh, in future uh, an artificial biological organ for the organ transplantation. Uh, that's the big thing. We, we don't have enough organs for transplantation. Yeah. Uh, do you think it's possible in future? Or, or we are far away from that, uh, that question? <laughs> <laughs> it's always difficult to predict future, and I'm, I'm careful. I'm personally very skeptical uh, about the opportunity to make a real new heart out of the di in the dish. However, uh, using these uh, tissues or cells, 
uh, as cardiac repair material is actually quite uh, efficient and we, we just have very nice data showing we can uh, use these patches to repair the heart, improve function and importantly compared to its cell injections we need about tenfold less cells. So we, we get the same results as other people like Chuck Murray with tenfold less and I think that's important. That's important and but the question is that basically what, what, what I have uh, read or I know is that how do you really uh, uh, make the native myocardium with the this batch myocardium synchronized together. The problem with this field is the arrhythmias, right? Because yes. they're not electro, uh, electrophysically coupled to each other. And how do we uh, overcome this problem? One answer is these immature cells have a great capacity to remodel. So in this case, I think it's even in, in a certain way an advantage to have these immature cells because they, they can still adapt interestingly as well. They can also divide. So these gra graphs get bigger over time, which is a very interesting feature. How exactly they couple and how extensive the coupling is, we see that there is coupling, but um, no final answer yet. I think it, it, it remains a problem because, I mean, conceptually, you put these patches on a, on a surface where between the viable myocardium and the patch is always scar. So it's a bit difficult. But, but there is evidence that uh, even fibroblasts uh, can couple. Mm -hmm. and that could be one answer to the question. I, I have another question for you, Tom. So with regards to the therapeutics, actually, have you thought about using your models to, to mimic some sarcomeric type mutations and diseases to find novel therapeutics for therapies? Yeah, we do actually. We have, um, well, a little bit one step further, uh, back. I mean, I know uh, uh, that uh, many people use this technology for disease modeling. That's what you're asking yes. for. And I think that's very promising. However, there is still, uh, I think, a big question mark of um, in, in, in to which extent these technologies are really robust enough and precise enough to model the effects of, let's say, one single heterozygous mutation. Right. So what we are doing with a big ERS, you know, European Research Can uh, Council grant, uh, we do a clinical study where we make 40 cell lines from normal donors f and 40 of uh, patients with cardiomyopathy and we do it completely blinded so the clinicians do all the clinical work the, the geneticists do all this uh, whole genome sequencing and we are doing the tissues and then we will test them and then after fi five years we will see whether we can really in a blinded fashion first define normal values of a normal function plus minus uh, SD and a systematic deviation from that normal function in these tissues. And I'm very open to that question. Let's see. Okay. But I think these kind of studies are important because, I mean, of course, if you know what you're looking for, you see what you, but that's about the state where we are. And I think we have to go one step further. Then it could be really a clinical test, uh, clinically used test. And of course, then you can also study um, mechanisms. Right. I mean, you can do that already, and many people do that. So I think it's a very promising uh, application. Oh, of that terrific. Thank now, you. So let, me, let, let me just uh, make it further. So it's all great, you know, uh, it's all great. perspective of uh, tissue engineering. And, uh, but what we learned from cell therapy, at least, is that you are whether putting the engineered tissue or the cells in the ischemic myocardium, which is inflamed, which has ROS, and cells don't survive, and what makes you think that, or how can we make the tissue cells survive in that uh, bad environment? Is this a big challenge, or if, if it is a challenge, how are you going to uh, rectify that? It is a very big challenge, <laughs> and I think you're completely right. Uh, sometimes these promises are a bit uh, too much compared to what's really de delivered. Um, I think nobody can answer that question, and uh, the, the difficulty is, what is I the... Can. Okay. okay, you can, but I cannot. Uh, uh, my, my problem is what is the next step to go with our tissues? I mean, now we need a model which is somehow more reflective, for, first by size, but also by mechanism, the situation you were just um, talking about. And that's very difficult. All of these models don't really um, uh, model what you are talking about, this inflamed environment, ischemia, very difficult situation. Right. Finally, probably you just have to test it. If, if, the, if the safety issue has been resolved, then you have to go on. Because and I, I mean, Philip Minashe yeah. did already in, in a very, let's say, very moderate uh, manner. What um, uh, Manashe did is uh, with the uh, fibrin patch, with the pluripotent stem cell derived myocyte, patch on the surface of the, the uh, progenitors, uh, LV, right? LV scar, 
was the uh, and the impatient with the myocardial infarction and the uh, close chest follow up. He has completed five patients and uh, the trial is still going on. Basically, what he sees is the patient feels better, exercise score better, so there's a great future. And uh, similar fibrin patch based uh, my side. Um, um, let's see, that is the IPSA do not have the cardiomyocyte and endothelial cells. We have published in cell stem cell, and the mechanisms are basically is the patch prevent the LV dilatation. So the overstretch of the myocyte are significantly released. Therefore, the, the wall stress decreased, the perfusion is improved, and the function is improved. We know the grafts can uh, sustain in the recipient heart. The, uh, from our hands, there's an interface between the grafts and the heart, recipient and the heart. There's a piece of fibrotic tissue in um, separate the uh, grafts and the tissue. So, right. okay, so, so the yes. basic mechanisms of the beneficial effect are from the um, prevent the LV bulging, improve the uh, wall stress um, uh, release. So the future is uh, bright.